your Bible open because we're about to look at one of the most important passages in the Old Testament. Some have said that chapter 7 of 2 Samuel is the most important text in the books of Samuel, 1st and 2nd, and the most important passage, one of the most important passages in understanding the whole Old Testament. So let's dive right in there at chapter 7 and see what God has in store for us. This is the scene. The time has eventually come for David to take his place on the throne. Well, actually, he goes down in history as being a king that didn't actually take his place on the throne, but accepted willfully his place on the throne. Enthronement meant in these days, really defeating the enemy. And we saw that last week when we considered the defeating of the Jebusites who were dwelling in the city of Jerusalem and the Philistines outside of the city and both were taken care of. But there was something wrong. The almost forgotten Ark of the Covenant, which represented relationship with God and his people, was missing from all the victory picks. It was more important to David that God would be central to life in Jerusalem, central to kingdom life, than even his own kingship. So plans were made to ship the, the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Well, actually, they put the Ark on a cart. They carted it to Jerusalem. And everybody, it seems, had grown a little bit casual with what the ark represented, the holiness of God, the presence of God with people. God had to then remind everybody about his chief attribute, his holiness. And once the schooling had taken place and the people had learned their lesson, they discovered one of the most glorious truths that we discovered last week, and that was that a humble fear of God stimulates joy. This healthy fear of God stimulates joy. So as the glow of sincere and heartfelt rejoicing subsides, lingers, there's still a little niggle um, in, in David's mind. There's a little niggle that's bothering him. And this was the niggle. While I'm living in this lovely new home, Remember, he got that gift of cedar wood. Must have smelt amazing. Um, he built a palace. While he's living in this home, the Ark of the Covenant is living in a tent. This is not the tabernacle. This is a tent that was especially made by David for the Ark. But this is the niggle that David is wrestling with. I'm living in this brand new home, and um, this is made for my household, but now the Ark is living in a little tent. What David did next is exactly what we do when we feel that same niggle. And that is, we start planning. We are literally planning machines. Now, that leads me to my first point for this morning. Point number one, God's plan is better. God's plan is better. Let's look at the first 16 verses of this chapter. David shares his concern, this niggle, with the prophet Nathan, uh, the niggle of the the home and the palace versus the tent. And what is so different and good to see now is that David is uh, consulting with the prophet at his right hand side. His right hand man is the prophet, um, not like it used to be where the right hand man was a commander. Nathan, not speaking the words of God, but using the best of human reason, encourages David to move ahead with what was on his heart, what was his plan. The grounds for the advice that was given uh, was this, that God was with David, verse 3. But God's plan and David's plan didn't align. David's plan, as reasonable as it was, was puny in comparison to God's glorious plan. So, right away, I can make some application. And I want to share that with you. Our best, most calculated plans are just not good enough. We don't see as God sees. We don't know anything compared to what God knows, his omniscient knowledge of all things factual and spiritual and carnal and other. So we need to be very quick. This is the application. We need to be very quick to surrender all of our plans to God. Even godly heroes have massive limitations. In the end, the kingdom of God 
is only safe in God's hands. And so I want to appeal to you to pray for leaders. Pray for your pastor, I beg of you. Pray for our church leaders. Pray for all Christian leaders, that they would be marked by wisdom. These are days where church leaders need extreme amounts of wisdom. And as we're invited by Scripture to pray for that, I'm going to ask you to pray for us as we make decisions literally uh, on a daily basis. Another application that comes out of this early part of the, of the text is God's plan is always much better. The point I'm trying to make here. I love this passage. Not only is it one of the pillars that holds up our understanding of the Old Testament, the entire Bible, the Davidic covenant found in this chapter. Um, I love this passage because of its focus being on the covenant-making God, our covenant-making God. Of course, it houses the Davidic covenant, but in the fabric of this chapter, we learn about the covenant-making God. Chapter 7 is a place for us to be wowed by God Himself. Now look at the passage. That same night, when, when uh, David and, and, and Nathan are having their discussions, God is aware of what they are talking about. There's no hint that David of David's plan or Nathan or any of the details of the plan, but God is aware of what's going on. And so he responds through the prophet Nathan as he receives a vision from the Lord. God puts David's plans on hold right then. God expects, God explains to David what's going on. And um, this is what he explains to David. For 300 years, this is how I imagine the conversation to go. For 300 years, I've lived in a tent. David may have asked why. Well, the answer God gave was to be with you. Through everything, I've never left your side. Why? Because I have a goal. God speaking. I have a goal and my goal is your rest. This is very important for us to understand. God said that he was content the way things are, and this is, this is what he was saying in essence, I will not rest till my people receive rest. And you'll find that in the theme that runs from verse 1 into verse 11. Verse 1 mentions rest, verse 11 mentions rest, and it acts as a bracket or a parenthesis around this idea. I will not rest, God speaking, I will not rest until my people have rest. David, you think that you've reached your rest. Verse 1, that's what David's thought. Reaching rest. Enemies defeated, now settled in the city, on the, on the throne, you've reached your rest, rest. But David, you have no idea. Rest is still coming and rest is available and coming way beyond you. You think of building me a house when in actual fact, I am the builder, verse 11. And I am the one that will make you a house. The Hebrew word can be translated both ways, either a house, a dwelling place, or a household. God here was speaking not of a palace. God was speaking of a dynasty. And this is the focus, really, of the rest of the Bible from this chapter onward. God was saying to David, I have humongous plans to accomplish through your dynasty. Not only to bring you rest from you rest from your enemies or the people rest during these days, but to bring mankind rest. The question that now lingers is how? Well, God answers the question to David and saying, I am going to bring rest to mankind through your offspring. Verse 12. The kings of David's dynasty, we know, and we're going to see in the next couple of chapters, were wicked. They were foolish. They were marked by weakness. But through the offspring of David, rest would come to mankind. Foolishness, weakness, wickedness, until a child was born. The son of David, born without sin, born to trample death, reigning forever at the right hand of God. Church family, God is pursuing the safety of His children. God is bringing us home. 
He has paid the cost. I was just reflecting on a passage in the New Testament, John chapter 1. And John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The Word became flesh, and the Word dwelt among us. It's a beautiful connection with God's words of Himself here. I'm contented to, to live among you, to live in a tent. And the word in the Greek for the John 1 14 verse is the word skene, which means literally to tent. In the footnotes of your Bible, you'll see it there, to tabernacle. Jesus Christ came and He tabernacled. He lived in a tent uh, with us, for us. He has paid the cost. He has chosen us when we don't deserve it, verse 8. He has never left our side and never will leave our side, verse 9. He has defeated our enemies, verse 9. Even the big enemies that we've spoken about through the study already, that are laid out in the covenant, verses 12 through 16, the covenant of David, the Davidic covenant. These big enemies of death are listed there. Death cannot touch God's promise in verse 12. Sin cannot derail God's promise, verse 14. Time won't frustrate God's forever plan through David. I mean, eight times, I think it is, eight times the word forever is mentioned. Forever, 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 expressing the permanence of God's promise. God's plan goes way beyond the rest that David was experiencing from his enemies. No, God's plan is better. So much better. The second point I'd like to make from this incredible chapter comes from verses 17 through to 24. So follow along with me. And this is the point. God's plan is gracious. God's plan is better. God's plan is gracious. After Nathan shared with David all that um, God had explained to him, this is what David did. He sat. It's interesting. He sat before the Lord. There's that audience of one again. There are times for us to get very excited about God's grace. That's what chapter 6 is all about. But there are also times to just sit, to wonder, and to contemplate God's grace. That's what David did. Verses 18 through 24 records David's response of praise to God for his grace. Firstly to himself and then grace expressed to the people. So I want to, I want to draw this out to understand the covenant making God, to understand his grace. So journey with me here. God's grace is firstly a previous grace. Verses 18 to 20. This is what highlights this point from those verses. You have brought me thus far, David said to God. In praise, you have brought me thus far. And I just for a moment thought about David's big picture. Field, shepherd boy, that's his beginnings. And now he's enthroned as king. God had brought him thus far. Through danger, through worry, through criticism, through weakness. God's previous grace was praised here by David. Notice secondly, God's promised grace. The grace of God is a promised grace. Verse 19. Verse 19 uses this language of a spoken promise. Of a distant future for David's dynasty. Then goes on to say that instruction, or another way to say it, promise. Instruction for all mankind. The benefits of David's kingship would stretch to all humanity. They'd be felt by all. All humanity, a promised grace for the future. Notice thirdly, God's grace is a purposed grace. Verses 21 and 22. This was all according to God's heart, David said. According to God's will, David said. God chose David just because he wanted to. Not because of any good or qualification in David. This was God's will, not because of any human thinking, any human planning, or any human merit. God's grace is a purposed grace. Then David gave God praise for his grace expressed toward his people. Number four, 
God's grace is a protecting grace. This is what we learn. Verse 23. People of Israel freed from the bondage and the, the being slave to masters in Egypt. They were freed from this bondage. Now to have a new master. His name is God. God's people don't belong to God because they are special. God's special God's people are special because they belong to God. That's the essence of what is being taught here in verse 23. To highlight God's grace being a protecting grace. Let me bring you up to speed. Previous grace. God's grace is a promised grace. God's grace is a purposed grace. God's grace is a protecting grace. Number five. God's grace is a preserving grace. First part of 24. Again. The people have not survived because they're amazing. They haven't survived because they're tough. No, they've endured only because of God's preserving grace. God preserved them. So here we see God's grace on display as being a preserving grace. And then lastly, God's grace is a permanent grace. Verse 24, the last part. Look at these words very carefully in your Bible. You, O Lord, became their God. David speaking of God, becoming their God. This is, if you look closely, it's wedding language. I went back to prove it and I, I looked at my wedding vows that I made on the 1st of January uh, 2011. Yeah, you got it right. One, 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 one. I told you we were planning machines. Well, that's my anniversary date. And on that day, I vowed these words. I call upon these persons here present to witness that I, Trent Trevor Ayers, do take you, Amber Marie Lunn, to be my lawful wedded wife. Did you see the actions there? Do take to be. The exact language that you will find in this chapter, 24, verse 24. I, God... Do take you to be my beloved people, and I shall be your God. Language of permanence. As I apply this, I want to invite you. You're probably sitting already, um, but take some time right now. I mean, in the in the hustle and bustle of of life, just to take a moment while you are seated, like David, just to ponder. And wonder over God's grace. You see, it's a, a previous grace. We are all here at this moment, seated, because of God's doing. God is the one that has brought us to this place. You might think that you're something or someone, but it's all God. Ponder that for a moment. It's all God. Promised grace. God has spoken and we have his word. We have all the promises of the scriptures and we, we can attain rest and, and we can find contentment in the word. We can find stability in the word. Promised grace for now and for future. God's grace is a purposed grace. Ponder this. He chose us not because of any good in us. But just because he wanted to. That's humbling. God's grace is a protective grace. He freed us. He has freed us from the bondage of sin. We belong to him. Therefore, we conclude he cares. He cares for us. We are, according to the scriptures, David's Psalms and others that he, he penned for us. We are his possession. Therefore, he cares for us. In the midst of lockdowns and and covids and concerns and worries and struggles with money and hunger all of these things that that burden us right now god is a god who cares he's proved it because he freed us from sin god's grace is a preserving grace we owe our survival we owe our endurance to him i was thinking of that passage in in philippians what god begins he will finish we owe that survival to him. 
God's grace is a permanent grace. We are his beloved bride. Such fuel for praise, right? As we, as we ponder and as we meditate, such fuel for praise. David's praise was given not by the greatness of a king or by any special nature of his people. God's, David's praise was not driven by those kinds of things, but by the grace of his God, by the grace of our God. May our praise be driven, not by the greatness of ourselves or our church or anything like that, but may our praise be driven by the grace of our God. Notice a third point for this morning. God's plan is certain. God's plan is certain. Verses 25 to 29. David's praise ends in prayer. He looked back in praise and he looked forward in prayer. And I would encourage you to do just the same today. You know, we look to a future and we don't have any answers really. Very uncertain future. Let's emulate David's, uh, David's actions here. Look back in praise, saturated by the grace of God. Let's look forward now in prayer. Praise and prayer are natural responses to hearing God's word. If God's will or God's plan is better than we could ever imagine or know, if God's will and his plan is more gracious than we deserve, then the core of our prayer ought to be a request or a plea for God's promises to become reality. For example, Jesus in the garden not my will, but yours be done. Your will be done. Or more specifically, let's look at this example for a minute. The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, which applies directly to us when Jesus teaches us to pray, he included this instruction, which comes as no surprise for those that are looking at 2 Samuel chapter 7 or understanding the words of 2 Samuel chapter 7, that Jesus would instruct us to pray, your kingdom come, God's kingdom come, your will be done, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's almost a direct parallel with chapter 7 in 2 Samuel. We all know the words well, don't we? We can say them by, by heart. Sadly, the Lord's Prayer has become a little bit of a good luck mantra. But what are we actually praying for in that line? Your will be be done on earth. Your kingdom come. What are we praying for there? Well, this is what David prayed for in terms of kingdom coming. David prayed, now, O Lord God. Look at your Bible there. O Lord God. Directly translated, my God. O my God. I just want to say a little excursus here. I've just been noticing in culture how that phrase, O my God, OMG, is used so much and so casually. It's, it's blasphemous in light of, of this text here. The richness of the words. Got to be careful about this kind of language. What we watch on TV and, and, and condone um, coming from the mouths of others. And um, especially our children. Got to be careful that children don't repeat things they pick up in culture like this. It's not just OMG. This is a deeply beautiful expression of relationship with the Lord. Oh my God. All that we've spoken about that we possess in God is, is summarized in that address in his prayer. O oh Lord God, the word you have spoken, this is what David's praying, the Lord you have spoken about your servant and about his dynasty, cause it to stand forever. That's how David prayed. That's the logic of the prayer. Now notice the logic of the, the Lord's model prayer given to us. Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. That's the address. This is the logic here. The word that you have spoken has, has somewhat been fulfilled. It has somewhat been fulfilled. Jesus has come. I mean, we're looking at this idea of logic of the progression of his prayer from after the cross. Jesus has come. His kingdom has been established. He currently reigns enthroned at the right hand of the Father. There's no more powerful position. So we're not praying for all those things. Those things have already taken place. What we are praying in terms of the word of God coming to fruition is this. We are praying that his kingship would be made public. 
When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying that his kingship would be universally displayed. Praying for him to come again and for his kingship, kingship to be fulfilled fully. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You have promised, verses 12 through 16, the Davidic covenant, you have promised. So we plead with you to make that happen, is how David was praying. I believe the key verse in this section 25 through 29 is verse 25. Do as you have spoken. Go ahead and underline that and reference yourself to Matthew 6. Your will be done. This should always be the pattern for our prayers. To plead God's promises. And we've talked about spending time in God's word and, and reading and filling your mind and your heart with the promises of God. Now, the prayer is to plead the promises of God. You know why? Because God spoke them. God spoke them. You know why? Because His word is true. His promise literally will come true. You know why? Because God's promises are good. Every time He makes a promise, that promise is good. God's Word stirs up praise. God's Word stirs up prayer. And as we spend time in it, may it stir and stimulate us to prayer. Your will be done, not mine. Notice that David's prayer was not full of his own worries. It's interesting. Really interesting. After he receives God's word like this, he's overcome by it. And so he's no longer filled with his own worries, lists of worry to pray to the Lord, or lists of plans, or lists of wants, or lists of goals and ambitions. No, no, no. David's prayer was full of what God had just said in his word, his promise to David. Overwhelmed by that. That's what comes out in his prayer and praise and request and plea for the Lord's will, His spoken word, to become action. John Woodhouse said, King David's prayer put into words the impact the word of the Lord had on him. I love that phrase. That's how our prayer should be. Our, our prayer should be putting into words the impact that the word of the Lord has made on us. Why? Well, this is why, because God's word is sure. God's word is trustworthy. Meaning, this is the kind of prayer that will always be answered. That's the kind of prayer you want to be praying. Hence David's courage, by the way, in verse 27. Courageous, courageous attitudes in prayer. I want to end with the, with the big picture of what's going on here. I'll do my best to explain the big picture of the Bible narrative from 2 Samuel chapter 7. You see, in the beginning, there was an agreement made between God and man that stipulated all the conditions for relationship, man to God. There was what really props up our understanding of this covenant, this agreement, is a promise of blessing for obedience. And we know what that blessing is, eternal life with God. Then, of course, on the other side of the spectrum, there's a promise of punishment as well. For disobedience, and we know what that is as well. Eternal death separated from God. Now, we know man failed to get the blessings of the covenant made originally with Adam. So, this is what God did. God established another means. And that means was grace. We didn't deserve it. But God richly bestowed that to us. He gave us another means, one by which we can now be saved. After the fall, God initiated an amazing plan of redemption. Now, sinful people can have relationship with Him on one condition. And the one condition stipulated in the scriptures is faith. Faith in the work of Jesus, death and resurrection, as our Redeemer. Faith in Jesus as our Redeemer. It's entirely based, this whole means of salvation is entirely based on the grace of God toward the redeemed. 
His promise, and this is where this chapter comes in, His promise, eternal life with God, that's what's promised, is the promise of the Old Testament, the promise of the New Testament. I will be their God and and you will be, they, the redeemed, will be my people. The Davidic covenant had been anticipated in God's covenant with Abraham. It would be through the Davidic king that David, the Davidic king, that God's promise of blessing to the nations would be accomplished. And this is exactly how this chapter ends. Look at it closely. The blessing of the promise made to Abraham, echoed and prayed for by David, has come to us. The gospel, the gospel, is the good news of this blessing. Fellowship forever with God is the gospel message. Fellowship now possible for sinners with a holy God. Good news that has come to the nations of the world. Through God's anointed King, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of David, Jesus Christ. And God's rescuing plan. I find it strange to even add an and. That's enough, right? But the story goes on. God is not done with his plan. His rescuing plan still has more chapters. The best is still to come. We look forward to a new creation where All the hope of God's plan expressed to David will be reality forever. This is what we are praying for. We look forward to a new creation where all the hope of God's plan explained to David here will be reality forever. Revelation 21 verse 3. And I heard... A loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Folks, God's plan is certain. Let's pray. Lord, when we stop and sit reflecting on your grace, giving us so much that we don't deserve, we are filled with praise. You are good. Your plans are best. You are trustworthy. Lord, we need the stability of your promises now. We need the stability of your promises for the future. We long more than anything else for the forever fellowship that is promised to us with you. So we pray like David this morning, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. God bless you. Hey there, everyone. After hearing today's message, if you have any questions, if you'd like to speak to somebody, or maybe you need some prayer, why don't you contact us on our website under our Good News tab at www.kbc.org.za. We'd love to hear from you there. Cheers.